we're going to work our way through. We're going to 100% speed run. Uh, although it's not speed running, it's very slow running. Um, our way through various philosophical texts. And today, it's going to be being in time. Today and for probably many months. <laughs> there's at least you know two things that you can take away from this one you will be able to uh see how i read philosophy right not to say that that's the best way or the only way but i do think it's a way that has been very successful for me and that i learned from uh teachers for whom it was very successful you know if you follow this this uh this learning strategy technique I think it can help you take books like Being in Time, for instance, that might seem impenetrable or obtuse or overly difficult. And in fact, find that you can read them, right? As long as you read slowly and carefully, you can read them and you can understand them. So that's one thing. It's uh, one value of this is it models reading, right? Because that's, that's what you don't get, right? You get, you get philosophy lectures where the instructor has already digested the material and now has packaged it in a neat little container that they're going to give to you, pass the information in, from their brain into yours or whatever, right? I mean, that's the idea. Whether or not that successful is debatable, at least some of the time. But um, to do it this way is to show how you actually approach the material yourself, right? Or at least one way that you can approach the material yourself is how to look at um a text look at a difficult philosophical text and start reading carefully right i mean one of the things that no matter which reading style you approach is true of philosophy is that you can't just sit down and just read it like um like you might read you know harry potter or something right it's it's it requires sort of active engagement from you and not just passive consumption of the text um, so this one one advantage of this is it could show you one way of reading or of approaching uh, reading a text like this and the other thing is that you know you're welcome to as uh, if you're watching this live um, or if you're watching it uh, on YouTube um, in the archive form you can still comment but if, especially if you're watching it live on twitch um, you can uh write in the chat and we can this can be a, a virtual reading group um and we can talk with each other right especially because and this this piggybacks off the first point but um if you're discussing a text and learning about a text um and working on a text you're not uh right you're doing the work of thinking through a text and especially not just thinking through this is an important point not just thinking through what a text says but also who is it responding to what kinds of answers is it giving to those questions um why are they compelling or why are they not um you know and also it, it invites you which is so important right to not just like let a philosopher give their ideas to you, but also to let you respond to that philosopher and, um, and, you know, debate with them, so to speak, right? See whether they're right or wrong, right? So that's also something that can happen here in the chat. So, yeah, so those are two, two things about this that I think makes it a little bit unique. Not that no one's ever done it before necessarily, although as far as I know, I am the first one to do it on Twitch. And obviously it has kind of a funny meme potential to do it on Twitch, but also there's something serious about it, I think. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do here. So I don't need to introduce any more. We can just get going with Sein und, Sein und Zeit. I don't really want to do like background of the text and biography of the text and shit like that. Uh, you probably know who Heidegger does is 
If you don't, student of Edmund Husserl, extremely important phenomenologist in the field of phenomenology, had an immense influence in philosophy in the 20th century, especially in France. Um, of course, as the great scandal, he was involved in the Nazi party. Um, so, so reading his work is no endorsement of his character. Yeah, and Being in Time, I believe, was published in 1927. And uh, it's the work that people most commonly read, partially because it's the least weird of any of his writings. But it's the early Heidegger, which is quite different from the later Heidegger, which is actually more com more popular, I would say, with actual Heidegger scholars, are the later kind of weird poetic essays that he wrote. Um, the most famous ones probably being like... Uh, what is it? is it? What is humanism? I think is what it's called. Um, in response to Sartre, uh, question concerning technology, of course, origin of the work of art. Um, those are some of the later works, and we'll probably read those at some point. But for right now, we're reading Being in Time. Unlike those short essays, this is a big, fat book. Yeah, so we're gonna read it. I think if you're gonna like Heidegger, at least stylistically speaking, you already will by this intro, which has this kind of amazing prophetic eschatological quality to it. It starts with this quote from The Sophist by Plato, which interestingly is when you read it, I, I read this and then after having read this, I read The Sophist. It doesn't have the same kind of gravitas that it seems to have in uh, Heidegger's in the way Heidegger quotes it here. But of course that's done on purpose, right? Um, it's a rhetorical and aesthetic technique that Heidegger uses. But so, unfortunately I can't read Greek. So we'll skip that. But we will, um, this right here is a translation of, of the Greek right there. For manifestly you have long been aware of what you mean when you use the expression being. We, however, who used to think we understood it, have now become perplexed. Um, so what's interesting, and then we'll talk too much about, about Plato's dialogue, but what's interesting, if you read Plato's dialogue, is that it, it's much more taxonomical and like, in what sense are you using being when you say this, than the sort of kind of gravitas that it, it feels like it has when um, Heidegger quotes it this way. Um, what's interesting uh, about the way that Plato does this is that how he ends up defining being, if I remember correctly, you can correct me in the chats if I'm wrong, but this, it has been a long time since I've read this sophist, is that he ends up defining it something like a uh, difference, right? Which if you know Heidegger or anyone that Heidegger has influenced, like every French philosopher in the 20th century, that becomes a very important idea that being is difference. What it means, but what it means for Plato in difference is, um, if I remember correctly, is that it's different senses, uh, different uh, uh, ways in which we can talk of a thing. To talk of it in different ways is the different senses of being of which we can talk about it. Um, and I've never read the 19th century philosopher and also I think, uh, I think he was like a priest or something, uh, Franz Brentano, sorry if that was a bad pronunciation, <laughs> Brentano, um, but Brentano, who was an influence on Husserl, who influenced Heidegger, although I think Heidegger actually read Brentano before he read or met Husserl, has this piece that was very important for Heidegger, um, called uh i think it was something like on the several senses of being and or several species of being i think it was senses on the several senses of being in aristotle and i've never read it but just guessing based on the title i think there's something something like that uh conception of being at work in um in brentano's uh, sense of being or his sense of Aristotle's sense of being, right? The sense of difference that there are, um, something is not just what it is in one way, right? It's not merely present as Heidegger will say, but it has 
possibilities across time. It's stretched across time, the different ways it might be, um, the different possible beings which are available to it, All right? Being in time begins in a moment of being perplexed, being confused at being, right? Heidegger says that being is like the glasses on our face. It's so close to us. We know it so well that we can't see it, right? You have to take the glasses off. You have to stop using glasses as glasses to even be able to comprehend the glasses themselves, right? Because when we're using them every day, they're too close to us. We, we don't even, they disappear. The apparatus of the glasses disappears. So uh, being has this quality about it, right? That it's something which we think we have known, but as we look closer, we become confused and realize that what is closest to us is in fact confusing. And we don't have some sense of, um, even the thing that is most closest and most fundamental, right? Descartes, I think, therefore I am. I'm there, I have being, I'm thinking, but but um, what does it mean that we have this being? Uh, it's not so clear. And um, it's a mood of perplexion, confusion, astonishment, maybe even anxiety. Um, a moment where the kind of perennial question of philosophy reemerges. I, I, I used to be, and I somewhat still am, but I used to be pretty convinced by the kind of view of philosophy, historically speaking, that, you know, you start from these basic questions that anyone has. What is the meaning of life? Why is there something rather than nothing? What does it mean to be a good person? And, you know, you look at uh, philosophy in uh, 2021 and people are asking questions like do aesthetic properties adhere in <laughs> uh, material objects do they supervene on mental properties whatever right these kinds of questions that no one would ever ask or even have a sense of what it would mean to ask that question right but 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 one view is that over time you build the discussion or the dialectic builds off of these basic questions and we refine our questions and we expand them and we go places we hadn't before. And that's how you end up asking a question like, do mental states exist, right? Uh, is consciousness supervenient or is consciousness, can we eliminate it, right? Um, things like that. And, and for a long time, I was convinced by that. And like I said, maybe I still am. I'm not sure. But Heidegger definitely, at least in this instance, is kind of opposed to that view. Pretty deeply opposed to it, I would say. That it's the loss of philosophy. It's like a reverse view. Rather than this building becoming closer and closer to the truth, it's getting further and further from the truth. Because for Heidegger, the truth, rather than some, uh, you know, perfect explanation of the world or model of the world that we're going to get to, that we're building up to, right, the truth is an event. And we'll have to talk a lot more about what that means to say the truth is an event rather than a model or a proposition or a statement or something like that. But truth is an event and specifically truth is when being lets its reveals itself or when we let beings be right so there's this initial moment and it's a moment of astonishment amazement or um being perplexed right as we see here which is a moment of truth happening right truth is an event it happens and then it pulls away and then it's gone right and that moment of truth happening or that event of truth happening is a moment where something like being comes forth, right? Unlike after that initial moment, right, where philosophy is born, right? Heidegger has this idea that philosophy emerges in certain places, you know, and it's actually not true, at least in his later work, that Heidegger thought it only happened in Greece. In his earlier work, it seems like maybe he did think it only happened in Greece, but in his later work, he was definitely for sure believed 
that there were multiple beginnings for philosophy. Um, but that these beginnings are moments, these moments of perplexion, these moments where the world stops, where we stop moving, going about our daily routines, and we're kind of shocked out of them, and being comes to the fore. And we see how confusing and how much we fail to see being. So this quote right here from Plato is significant, right? Not only because it's about the question of being, which is what this book is about, um, but because uh, because it's potentially for Heidegger the beginning of philosophy in the West, right? The reason that Heidegger can even write is because of this moment where being emerges in ancient Greece, or for the first time someone sees being, right? Because of what happened in ancient Greece. And the idea is that this building up of concepts over time, like I was talking about, is actually a continual loss of that initial truth, right? The truth gets solidified into a concept, right? Specifically, as we'll see, I believe the, that concept is essence or essentia, right? Is It's the, you know, kind of bastardization of, um, of Plato's ideas, especially Heidegger thinks in the way that uh, Romans uh, took uh, Greek philosophy and what they did with it. Right, and then you have these concepts, and the concepts are ossified, and they're taken away from the truth, and you're building on these concepts, and you're building, and you're building, and rather than like a staircase to the truth, it's more and more crust and dirt and decay on top of truth, right? So truth is getting, we're not getting closer and closer to the truth, truth is getting more and more buried, so that what, what, what the task of philosophy to be today would be to figure out how to have this authentic encounter with being again to break down all the concepts crush them scrape all the dirt and grime and get back to the to the initial moment of unveiling or of truth the event of truth of being showing itself and so this is again this moment of being perplexed right it, it, it's a it's a that philosophy is always about coming back to this initial moment, this initial moment of just being astonished that there's something rather than nothing, right? And Heidegger pays a lot of attention to moods, um, to how we feel about things, because um, that's also how they show up, according to Heidegger, are being sort of shocked or amazed at there being something rather than nothing is the path uh, or the, the root or the... Uh, what does he call it? The, um, the way, I guess, or the, there's a word I'm thinking of, uh, whatever, but like the little trails, right? That he's walking in the black forest. These, um, this way of allowing being to be, allowing, letting beings be, right? So, okay, that's the kind of discussion we're going to be doing, right? And this is why it's going to take us a long time, but it's, it's what I think needs to happen for philosophy. Do we, in our time, have an answer to the question of what we really mean by the word being? Not at all. So it is fitting that we should raise anew the question of the meaning of being. It's not just, right, and this is one way in which you can misread Heidegger, and even people who read Heidegger extensively can make this mistake. Um, the philosopher uh, Pete Wolfendale, if you know him, I uh, wrote a very good dissertation uh, actually on this, which I haven't read all of. I've read about half of, and I'm going to read the rest of it because it's really great. Um, that really emphasizes this importance of the questioning, which Heidegger also emphasizes. So it's it's um, it's a real mis misreading or misuse of Heidegger um, to lose this aspect of the question, right? And also Derrida, for instance. Um, emphasize the influence of Heidegger's thinking about the question in his own thought. Maybe we could even watch it, but I, I won't for right now. But Derrida has a good interview talking about the meaning of the question. But what it means to raise the question of the meaning of being is not even just to say what is being, 
or you know why is there something rather than nothing like i was saying but also how does one even ask that question right and this as we will see is going to end up being one of heidegger's points that we've lost the ability to even have an encounter authentic encounter with being or to get back to it right because of those stacked up crusted concepts of history that we've lost an ability to even understand how to ask that question because any question we could ask any question whose goal would be to discover the meaning of being already has so much ideological baggage tied into that question that it's not even possible for us to ask the question right because the way in which we have asked the question which as you'll see is going to be something like what is the being of this being right which tiger thinks already assumes a ton of things about being especially right that it assumes being is an entity or a kind of thing and you know it's stable it doesn't change and it's determined as what it is right it's like stable unchanging matter right it's a thing so the way we ask the question already has defined being right because a question narrows the limits of what is possible right in the way in which the question of being has been asked as we have inherited it in the legacy of western philosophy has already foreclosed the possibility of discovering the meaning of being so just remember that the question of the meaning of being do we in our time have an answer to the question of what we really mean by the word being not at all so it is fitting that we should raise anew the question of the meaning of being but are we nowadays even perplexed at our inability to understand the expression being not at all so first of all we must reawaken an understanding for the meaning of this question our aim in the following treatise is to work out the question of the meaning of being and to do so concretely our provisional aim is the interpretation of time as the possible horizon for any understanding whatsoever of being so the goal of this book right our aim in the following treatise is to work out the question of the meaning of being and to do so concretely which is important right is there's a goal which is present here and completely disappears in the later work there's a goal of doing so concretely rather than abstractly rather than free floating metaphysical speculation it's to be concrete and you know phenomenological so one thing i mentioned right when you re read philosophy is that not only should you be interpreting what is the author saying but what kinds of debates are they responding to and who are they responding to um and you know the more philosophy you, you you can't read everyone and you have to start somewhere right so it's just inevitable that you keep coming back to text and you see things in there that you didn't see before so if you read this and you haven't read Husserl that's fine but let me point out to you that there's something in this uh line that's very important um that's from Husserl this last line our provisional aim is the interpretation of time as the possible horizon now for Husserl the horizon is something like the set of all possible ways in which a phenomenon might appear so take this water bottle for example here's a way it might appear here's a way it might appear with the thing on the front here's a way it might appear here's a way it might appear I might uh, um, well let's not get into that debate right now but you know I might I might use it as a weapon um, I might put it in an art museum right there are many different ways in which some you know a, a chemist might see this not as an object of you know of a water bottle but as a bunch of chemicals that are more fundamental to it or vice versa so the horizon is literally if you think about the horizon as the kind of circle visual metaphor the circle around something it's all the different points from which you can see 
something. And since for Husserl, what something is, contra the classical metaphysical view, is not, you know, some entity independent of its appearance for me, for an observer. It's what it is as it appears to me, right? So the reason that this water bottle is that it has a being as a water bottle is that I look at it and I see it there and I recognize it as a bottle which contains water out of which I can drink water, which I will do. Now it has many different ways of appearing to me, like I just showed you. I can see it all these different ways. I can do other things. Um, those are all possible bandages from the horizon around which I can see um, this water bottle. So everything has a horizon for us, right? And for Heidegger too, at least in the early work, it's it's a very contentious point of debate in the later work. And he says. Our provisional aim is the interpretation of time as the possible horizon for any understanding whatsoever of being. He's making an argument which is responding to and using Husserl's concept of horizon, but he's not using Husserl's concept. He's saying our provisional aim is the interpretation of time as the possible horizon, so that being all the different ways in which beings can be, like we were talking about earlier, all the different ways in which being can be is determined by the horizon of time, right? So, so we'll talk about what that means a lot. That's like, it's why the book is called Being in Time. So here we are. Time for Heidegger is the horizon, right? And it's the reason that I'm not static, right? Um, to use a kind of simple example, uh, there's me when I was a baby, there's me now, there's me when I'm going to be old, there's me when I'm going to be dead. Those are all me, but they're radically different, right? Similar in certain ways also, but different. Those are different points on the horizon of which I can be. And so that what's preserved across that horizon isn't my being as I am, as I appear, it's something else, which is what is the, the key kind of investigation of this text. What is my being? Why, how do I have being that makes me the same now as when I was a baby, when I'm in old age, when I'm dead, etc. But it's a really important thing to notice right now that he's giving us kind of the thesis of the book. But of course, you have to read the book to even really make sense of the thesis. But the thesis of the book is this. Being has time as its horizon. But the reasons for making this our aim, the investigations which such a purpose requires, and the path to its achievement call for some introductory remark. So like I just said, uh, we have to read the book to even make sense of that thesis. But that is the thesis. Thank you.